opens his eyes and he immediately becomes fascinated by the entire experience. And this is again, of course, the power of peer pressure. And this is again, of course, this treatment about addiction because we're told now that all of a sudden um, he, he will become very, very, um, Olympus will come very interested in gladiator shows and he kind of becomes then distracted from his studies and everything else because he's so into this. The point is, of course, that um, you can't do it alone. You can't find happiness uh, for Augustine. You can't find happiness alone with just your intellect. Olympus thought that he could and he couldn't. Then in book six, we're told about Mom Monica's marriage plans for Augustine. Now this disturbs a lot of people when they read it for the first time. Some of it's culture and so we have to forgive it. Mom arranges for Augustine to marry a girl who is 12 years old. He's going to have to wait two years until she's ready to be married at 14. And this means several things. One, that Augustine has to break his ties with his mistress, his lover, who he's had for years now. It breaks his heart to do it, but he decides to do it. Two, his son will leave his mother and will now stay with Augustine. Three, mom is making these marriage arrangements for no reason other than political reasons, okay? In other words, the girl that he's supposed to marry has got political connection vis-a-vis -vis her family. All of this is going to take its toll. Augustine decides to go along with it, but then interestingly, he turns right around and takes another mistress, which again makes us think about, doesn't it, Aeneas, who has a wife, leaves her at Troy, and then falls in love with Dido in Carthage, right? But he can't, he can't explain his sadness. Maybe sadness is the wrong translation out of the Latin. I think the better translation is longing. Because it's not just sadness, and it's not just, you know, that word ennui comes to mind, right, from our Baudelaire study. It's not just ennui, it's not just <sighs> kind of a resignation. It's a deeper, it's a longing, it's a spiritual needing, it's a longing for something. We enter book seven with some big questions. For example, Augustine will ask, what is God like? If we're going to talk about God, what is God like? So, for example, somebody asks Augustine the question later in his life, do you believe in God? He'll say, define God. Well, what do you mean define God? Well, you just used the word, so define God. What is God like? I mean, what, what do you mean by God? Well, this is an interesting question for Augustine, and it's not one he's going to shy away from. How about this one? Why is evil in the world if God is God of perfection? And what is evil? Like, we use this term all the time, evil. Like, what is that? Right? How about this question? If God is all powerful and perfect and good, then why make humans capable of sin? That is to say, why give humans free will? We ask this question, of course, in our study of Milton and Paradise Lost, right? Why would a perfect being feel the need to ever create in the first place? Well, to worship God will be Milton's answer. Augustine's going to ask the question, why would a perfect being ever need worship? It doesn't make any sense. We'll get to, you know, again, we'll get to some of Augustine's answers. You can go and look at our answers in the lectures on Milton if you want. Finally, God is perfect, right? Therefore, nothing about God can be imperfect. Are humans made in the image of God? Are they perfect or imperfect? Explain that one. Well, it's in Book 7 that uh, Augustine gets around to admitting that astrology is obviously false on two counts. Think about it. Two people born, he gives the example of a master and a slave, two people born on exactly the same date at exactly the same time, but they end up with two different kinds of life's, life's journeys. Therefore, clearly, I mean, if, if, they were, if, if, if astrology worked and the horoscope worked, then their horoscopes are exactly the same, and therefore they should be the same, and of course it doesn't work. But the second one is way more important to Augustine, and it becomes way more important to our understanding of philosophy in the West, and it's this. If you believe in astrology and the horoscope, then you kind of believe that the stars, right? The, remember the lines from Romeo and Juliet of Shakespeare, star-crossed lovers? If you believe that the stars determine your trajectory in your life, well, then you don't have any free will. And everything for Augustine is ultimately going to come around to this notion of free will. Why? Because if there is such a thing as free will, then there's the ability to seek 
for God and find one's true happiness in God. So free will is a huge part of understanding Augustinian theology later, right? Well, he's constantly asking all of these questions about what is God like, and he, and he has a problem. He thinks of God in anthropomorphic or physical ways. And the minute one does that, one, of course, is going to butt up against all kinds of interesting questions, right? So, for example, if you think about an anthropomorphic God who can love, then you also have to think of an anthropomorphic God who can hate. And then immediately you get kind of into this tension problem that is the Manichaean heresy that he's starting to already leave. It's at this point in his life in Book 7 that he is rescued, he says, by picking up the Platonists. Now, he never gets into this, who are the Platonists? We kind of think it's probably Plotinus and his pals. Plotinus, that great thinker of the Platonist tradition. But what fundamentally is it that he discovers? Well, we've talked about this in other lectures. It's that kind of two-box theory that we've put on the whiteboard before. And in the left-hand side, we'll put above that box the word physical, everything that you can see, touch, taste, etc. And then in the other box, we're going to put metaphysical above that box. Now, of course, this comes from Plato's Republic and books 6 and 7 of the Republic, and I've given full lectures on that. But just to remind you, in the first box, that which you can see, taste, touch, etc., you'll put a beautiful body a beautiful face, uh, but in the second box, you're not going to put that, you're going to put the word, the concept beauty, right, which is not anything that you can touch, or another way to think of it, as we've said before, and this is kind of where Augustine will go, there is a monumental difference between hooking up and exchanging fluids, sex, and this thing we call love, right? Of course, this will be true for all of the concepts that we will put in the second box, right? So, for example, in the first box, we will put the human body. But what are you going to put in the second box? Well, as we've pointed out in other lectures, Plato argues, no, no, there's a second you. No question, there is this you that's your body, but there's a second you. That's called your mind. Well, where is your mind? If I cut open your brain, am I going to see your mind? No, no, no. It's not the way it works. Oh, so it doesn't exist. Oh, no, it definitely exists. In fact, think of it. You have to actually posit a mind to argue that you don't have a mind. But where is it? Well, it's, again, what we will call metaphysical, beyond the physical. Of course, when we put the number two, and this is where Plato went with his uh, a tribute to Pythagoras, right, the great mathematician, when you put the number two up on the whiteboard, that isn't actually a two, is it? It's a symbol of a concept called two. That is to say, where is two? And the minute that, this, that Augustine stumbles onto this idea, he immediately is ready to start thinking about God. Oh, so God is not something physical, but rather something metaphysical. I mean, we've pointed this out in other lectures, that for Augustine, he recognizes there's one thing to say that God loves, and he certainly believes that, no question. But it's very interesting as a word picture. In other words, it's kind of an anthropomorphic word picture. A kind of being like a father figure reaches out arms and gives you a hug, and we call that God loves. That's one word picture. But how do you provide a word picture for the biblical scripture verse that Augustine's going to wrestle with much in his life? God is love. Augustine will say, give me a word picture for that. You can't give me a word picture for that. God is love. That's beyond language. That's translinguistic. That's God as metaphysical, something beyond the physical. Welch leads him again to the question of evil. Well, then what is evil? If evil is not something that's an actual physical presence, he comes to realize evil as the absence of good. Now, this will be a huge idea in the history of Western thought, and it runs something like this. I have a shirt. The shirt, of course, is the shirt. I get a hole in the shirt. Now there's no shirt where the hole is. Well, for Augustine, that's what evil is. Evil is not actually a physical presence. It is the absence of good. It is the absence of God, or in the case of my shirt, it's the absence of the shirt, i.e., the whole itself, right? But he defines evil another way. And for Augustine, this is the psychological component. Evil is the turning away from God, right? In other words, turning away from God, being distracted, addictions, if you will, is what makes you less whole, less free, less complete. Ergo, evil is a turning away from the good. Right? Now, it's at this point... He says it in book seven. 
He knows that there is a God. He even intellectually is ready to begin to accept Christian theology, but he cannot let go of his desires, namely, of course, his sexual lust, his addiction, if you will. It, which reminds us of his pal in the gladiator uh, story. That pal wasn't interested in lust. In fact, he said, I tried sex once, it wasn't that great. But he loves the going to the gladiator um, arena, and he loves watching that. Later, we're going to hear about Monica, his mother, who, when she was younger, she had an attraction to wine for a while. This is really an interesting case study of what is addiction and how does it work, right? And at the very end of book seven, he says, I'm really glad that I came to the Platonists first and then to Scripture later because it was Athens, the philosophers, who helped me learn how to appreciate the texts of Jerusalem, the, 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 the biblical text. And most importantly, he loves to read his St. Paul, right? Of course, Paul is the greatest first theologian who takes the teachings of Christ and turns them in many ways into Christian theology. And Augustine is forever grateful for that. Let's turn now to Book 8. Book 8 is, of course, the heart of the Confessions because Book 8 is going to tell us about how St. Augustine, Augustine receives his conversion experience. In the history of Christian theology, nothing, it seems, is probably more important than the conversion experience, and the classic example of a conversion experience is the conversion of St. Augustine. Let's begin Book 8. Here's the challenge. The challenge is for Augustine, he knows that scripture is right, but he cannot give up what he wants right now more than anything. And he says it this way in Book 8. He says, I was wretched, most wretched, in the very commencement of my early youth, had begged chastity, dis sexual temperance, sexual discipline, of the said famous line. Some have argued this is the most famous line of all of confessions, give me chastity and, con, uh, and, and discipline, right? Self-discipline, sexual discipline. Only, not yet. For I feared, lest thou shouldst hear me soon, and soon cure me of the disease of lust, which I wished to have satisfied, rather than extinguished. Now, this is the human condition. We want to improve ourselves. Watch the athlete. Okay, I need to get up and I need to train in the early morning so that I can be sure that I'm ready for the season that's coming. Okay, I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning and I'm going to go work. <laughs> Some of you are smiling already. You know where this is going. And you remember, of course, our questions and comments about the famous to be or not to be speech of the Hamlet play, right? Yeah. In other words, I make up my mind. I say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. This is really important. I'm going to do this. In other words, we say we're going to do this. But then, 5 o'clock comes, and it's really, uh, and I'm tired, and I know I want to do it, but knowing and doing are not the exact same thing, are they? I know I've said I want to do it, right? And we sometimes will say this, I want discipline, but not yet, tomorrow. Tomorrow I am definitely doing it tomorrow. Again, that's the Hamlet lines, right? Thus conscience makes cowards of us all, and enterprises of great pitch and moment with this regard turn awry and lose the name of action. We say we're going to do something and then we kind of, we run out of good reasons to remember why we were going to do it. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why Augustine will define sin as to forget. Sin is for Augustine not so much what one does, but why one does it. In other words, a forgetting of who or what one was. And he says that in my early years, I wanted, I wanted discipline. I wanted to be able to not be so controlled by this addiction to sex, but I didn't want it yet. I didn't want it yet because I was enjoying it too much. He then will meet at, um, St. Ambrose's uh, mentor, uh, Simplicitius, and he hears a story about Victorinus. And um, he, he, Victorinus was a really famous guy who decides, all right, all right, all right, I'll be a Christian, but I'm going to get baptized quietly, and I'm not going to let anybody know. And ultimately, Victorinus came to realize, as did Augustine, this doesn't work. If you decide you're going to become a Christian, you have to become a part of the church. And the church is a community. The very word itself, the Greek word ecclesia, actually means community, right? Um, and so it's a, it's a gathering, it's a group. And so Augustine starts to wrestle with the idea 
that he is going to have to do something that will be public. At the same time, he has another story that's very important, and it's mentioned several times here in these books. It's the story of the great um, um, church de desert father, Anthony, who is going to have gone through an experience where he walks into church and he hears a famous sermon scripture being read about give everything away that you have, sell all you have, and come and follow me. And immediately this is exactly what he does, and he goes off into the desert and he lives the life of a monk for the rest of his life. There's a lot of this happening in the mind of Augustine in the story that now will be told. Note the irony, though. He's unwilling to give up sexual lust, the very thing that is so much keeping him enslaved. It's the human condition, Augustine will say. Now to the conversion experience. One, all alone. Two, at a friend's house, that's significant, in a garden. So already we're thinking about the overtones of Genesis 3. Three, under a fig tree, this time not a fig, not a pear tree, but a fig tree. Not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil from Genesis 3, but a fig tree. Of course, if you know your Christian theology, Christ has something to say to fig trees once in his ministry, right? And of course, gardens immediately make, make us think not only of the Garden of Eden, Right? But also make us think of that garden where he stole the pears from, remember, earlier in the confessions. And of course, for those of you that know your Christian theology, the Garden of Gethsemane is where Jesus will have his major, major prayer to God, let this cup pass from me, not thy will, but not my will, but thine be done, and all of that. All of that's happening here. Okay. And Augustine is in the terrible midst of a wretched, wretched emotional state. He's asking, why can't I do the things with my will that my mind is telling me I should be doing? How is it possible? I can control my body so easy. I can tell my arm, rise, and it rises. Fall, and it falls. Why can't I do that for my mind? Why can't I tell my mind, you will do this, and then you do it? He's in the middle of all of this. When all of a sudden, this battle, we might say, of the will against itself, when all of a sudden he hears the voice of a child, and at first he's like, dude, what is that? And then he hears it's like singing or chanting. And this voice says some words. So now Augustine is listening, is hearing words, right? And the words are, take it and read it. Um, now, obviously a reader of this text who's a skeptic will say, was this a real voice or was this just something in his, in his head? And I think that misses the point. The point is that Augustine hears a voice and the voice says to him, take it and read it. And so he's like, okay. Is this like maybe like a little riddle by a child or something? Like, you know, a little mantra, a little singing, a little song? No, I don't know any of those. And then he decides, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and follow my instincts on this one. And he turns around and he goes inside. And there he picks up the first book that he finds, which just happens to be the writings of the Apostle Paul. And he picks these up. He says, I seized, I opened, and in silence read that section. By the way, this silent reading thing is something he pointed out Ambrose loved to do. And he was kind of stunned by it because he only knew reading is something that you did publicly, of course, for show. And he, know, and, he, and he saw Ambrose never wasting his time. If he had any moment, he would pick up a text, usually biblical text, and he would read in silence. And so here, in silence, he says, I read that section on which my eyes first fell. This is an interesting idea. You open up the book, the very first thing you see, you read it and you determine that it's going to be important for you. By the way, as a side note, this was actually done in churches all over Europe with the Bible, but it, believe it or not, it was actually done, historians tell us as well sometimes, in churches for Virgil's epic poem Aeneid. Well, kind of interesting. Okay, so I read silence, and in silence I read that section on which my eyes first fell. And here it comes from the book of Romans, chapter 13, verse 13. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, lustfulness, not in strife, strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh in lust. Well, so it's almost as if the very thing he's been most struggling against, his sexual addictions, his inability to commit to commit full-heartedly to Christian theology and doctrine because of all of his questions. He picks up the, this book and he reads Romans 13, 13, and that's the verse that he reads. 
And then he says in Confessions, No further would I read, nor needed I. In other words, I didn't need to read anymore. For instantly, and that's an important word, at the end of the sentence, by a light, as it were, of serenity, peace, infused into my heart, all the darkness of doubt vanished away. Whoa. So this conversion experience for him, let's say three things about it. One, it comes first with a voice. Two, it comes with reading a scripture. So everything about Augustine is about the exchange, the identification with text. Go back, for example, to some comments that I made in Coldridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and the way in which at the end of that story, that young man identifies with that story so much that he not only does not go to the party that night, but he wakes up the next morning a sadder and a wiser man. In other words, he identifies with the text. It's an important idea, and I think in many ways Coldridge and others probably derive this idea from Augustine. This is the pivotal moment in, the, in, in Christian literature about what a conversion experience is, is like, and it comes in the form of reading a text, engaging a text. And then finally three, at the moment that he meets this text, he no longer needs to read anymore. In other words, there's enough knowledge, there's enough reading, there's enough knowing. Now comes the action. And then at that moment, what, of course, James Joyce will talk about as the great epiphany, right? At that moment, there is an epiphany. There is a, a powerful kind of, suddenly here, we've, we've got the word serenity that will infuse into my heart. Let's go ahead and call it what it is and what he will call it for the rest of the confessions and for the rest of his life. He called it love, true love. It was at that moment that he realized that all of the things that he had experienced in terms of his lust and his sex and all the hooking up, that wasn't